righty, well, good evening. Good to see everybody back in the house of God this evening. Have you had a good day? The Lord gave us a good day, didn't he? We had a great service this morning and a great message from Brother McBride. And, and of course, we're ready for some more. Amen. It's like a good meal. You just go back for more, don't you? You just keep going back. And, and God fills us up every time. So uh, it's good to see you tonight. And uh, you'll be praying for, for our meeting. I hope you are. I know you are. And for this week. And uh, uh, God does mighty things. Oh, do we believe God's able? Amen. We know that he is. And so we're going to trust him for that and, uh, and uh, uh, turn it over to him. Amen. And sit back and enjoy. Because as children of God, if you're a, children, if you're a child of God tonight, then you know what I'm talking about. And if you're not, you can be. Amen. You see, God is still in the saving business. So praise the Lord for that. Well, we're going to start off with a song. So if you'll stand together, Gary's going to come. We're going to sing My Savior's Love. So let's stand together and sing tonight. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he can a sinner condemned unclean how marvelous how wonderful and my song shall ever be how marvelous how wonderful is my Savior's love for me for me it was in the garden he prayed not my will but thine he had no tears for his own griefs but sweat drops of blood for mine how marvelous how wonderful and my song shall ever be how marvelous how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. In pity, angels beheld him and came from the world of light to comfort him in the sorrows he bore for my soul that night. How marvelous! How wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. He took my sins and my sorrows. He made them his very suffered and died alone. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. When with the ransomed in glory his face I at last shall see. Will be my joy through the ages to sing of his love for me. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. Amen. We're going to go to the Lord in prayer. I have these prayer requests. I want you to pray. We mentioned this this morning uh, for uh, David and June Bailey's daughter, Kim, uh, in uh, Princeton Hospital with infection around her heart. So let's remember her uh, tonight. And also, Sandy, give me this request now for Ruth Farley. 
that's your sister-in-law, right, has um, uh, cancer, and they're getting ready to put her under hospice care. And so let's remember Ruth Farley tonight in our prayers. And let's remember each other. Let's pray for our nation, our country. Let's pray for lost people, uh, people fighting sickness. You know, there's COVID, and then there's cancer, and there's heart disease. We've got all kinds of troubles, don't we? But God knows them all, and uh, God knows what needs to be done. And, and our, our business is to pray and trust God. Amen. And trust God. He'll, he'll, he'll never make a mistake. Might not be always what we want, but God will never make a mistake. He'll do what is right and good. And so we need to pray for our nation today. Our president and, and first lady have come down with sickness, with the COVID, and we want to pray for them and uh, ask for healing for them. And then we want to pray for our nation. Oh, how our nation needs revival. It needs God. And it begins with us, you see. Uh, if, 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 I, if I want revival for somebody else, it better begin with me first. Amen. And then we might see revival. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Our Father, which art in heaven, dear God, we thank you, Lord, for another day that you have so blessed us with. And God, this opportunity to gather in the house of God one more time. Thank you, Lord, for these folks that are here tonight. We thank you, Lord, for your presence that's in this room. And God, we ask you now to meet with us and feed us at your table tonight. Lord, bless these, the singing, Lord, and the songs that will be sung, these great songs of Zion. Lord, we were reminded just a while ago of our Savior's love for us. And Father, what a, what a great love that was. No greater love than this, the Bible says. And so, Father, we thank you for the love of God that's so real. And Father, we pray for the man of God tonight. You'll be with Brother McBride as he preaches the word to us. Lord, fill him that he might help us. Lord, we're here tonight to receive help. And God, we need your help. And we thank you over the help that is given to us through the precious word of God. Bless this meeting, Father. Not only tonight, but the rest of this week. We pray that souls will be touched and Christians revived and, and lost people hear the gospel and be saved. And Father, we pray for the needs, Lord, of, of many people. I know many people tonight has a need upon their heart. I pray for those that are lost, that they might be saved. Lord, I pray for those that are sick. We pray for the healing, Lord, that only you can give, Father, tonight. And we pray for these that were mentioned. We pray for Kim Bailey. Lord, she'll be with her there in the hospital. And, Lord, help her. And, Father, we pray for Ruth Farley fighting the cancer. Father, we ask you, Lord, for uh, comfort for her and her family uh, for, uh, tonight. And, Lord, we pray for David. He had to leave this morning from the service. And, Lord, we thank you that he's doing better. ask you, Lord, to be with him and help him and dream a tonight as well. I pray for Brother McBride and his family, Lord, as, as they're suffering sickness and a family member of theirs. And we ask, Father, for comfort. I'm so thankful, God, that the Word of God tells us you're the God of all comfort. And, Lord, that you comforteth us in all our tribulation. No matter what we may face, God, you are our comfort today, Lord. You've promised to help us. We thank you for that. Now, Lord, bless our nation. Bless our president sick tonight and the First Lady. Help them, Father. And Lord, we have an election coming up. Father, we need your help. Lord, give us the wisdom, God, to a vote according to the Word of God, not according to what we hear, not according to what man has to say, but let us read our Bible, and that will direct us in the way that we should go. Father, forgive us, Lord, of our sin. Help us, Father, to be faithful people. Lord, as we face temptations in this life, Father, you've, helped, you've promised to help us in the Word of God. You told us there, there's no temptation taking you, but it's common to man, but God is faithful. So, Lord, help us to do the right thing. And, Father, we thank you, God, for a place together. Thank you for safety, Lord, that you've given us and help and strength. And now, Lord, bless this time together in the house of God as we pull up to the table tonight. Lord, we ask you to feed us, Lord, uh, that we may leave here full, running over. If somebody else will receive the blessing, somebody else will see the goodness of God flowing out of us. So, Lord, have your way tonight. We love you and thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated uh, tonight. I'm going to try to sing a song. Uh, every time I try to sing it, I mess it up. But that's common. Amen. So I'm like Joe Arthur. Remember Joe Arthur told us, said, well, if, if, you, if, you, if you're serving God and you hit a rock, you know what you do? Just back up and hit her again. Amen. If you'll hit it long enough, it'll move. Amen. So if you mess up, it used to bother me and I messed up. And I realized you better quit letting that bother you. Uh, you're going to spend your life bothered. Amen. So just back up and hit it again. Amen. So we're going to hit it. Help me. Pastor Mays will help me. I 
I can't keep the tears from falling from my eyes when to a loved one I have to say goodbye and though my heart is breaking with joy I still can sing I have a promise we will meet again someday and oh, what a promise, how it thrills my soul, for we'll be united where storm clouds never roll. After the shadows of night have passed away, no, oh, what a promise we will meet again someday. Now it's the song of the church for all the children of the King. It's so oh brave, where's your victory? Tell me death, where is your sting? For it's through the blood of Jesus all my sins are washed away. And I have this promise we will meet again someday. And oh, what a promise, how it thrills my soul, for we'll be united where storm clouds never roll. After the shadows of night have passed away, and oh, what a promise we will meet again someday. And oh, what a promise, oh, what a promise, oh, what a promise we will meet again someday. Amen. Isn't that good? God's promise. God's promise. Okay, Gary, let's sing. All right, if everyone will please stand. We're going to sing at the cross. Please stand. and did my Savior bleed and did my Sovereign die would he deliver that sacred head for such a worm as I at the cross, at the cross where I first saw the light and the burden of my heart rolled away it was there by faith I receive my sight, and now I am happy all the day. Was it for Christ that I have done? He groaned upon the tree. Amazing pity, grace unknown, and love beyond degree. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight and now I am happy all the day. Well might the sun in darkness hide and shut his glories in when Christ the mighty Maker died for man the creature's sin. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. But drops of grief can the debt of love I owe. Here, Lord, I give myself away. Tis all that I can do. At the cross, 
cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. Thank you. You may be seated. Amen. Boy, it's so good to hear you singing. Amen. Isn't, isn't it good to sing? You ever think about what you're singing about? At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light. You know what that light was? That was everlasting light, wasn't it? Amen. And them songs, if you'll give them songs a lot of thought, and uh, you know we could live in a day of a lot of pain and a lot of sorrow. But boy, every now and then, you know, you ever find yourself just going along and singing a song? You ever do that? song would just come into your head and isn't it amazing how that can uh well how that can just bring you happiness and joy and i found out that when when life hits you hard and it becomes sad just sing a song it's a whole lot better than crying amen even though you may cry a little bit too i used to run around you know i worked in the funeral home for years and i'd run around singing all the time and one of them guys said how come it is you sing all the time I said, what's better than crying? Amen. I said, and I found out that, boy, there's joy in singing. And, 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 and you know, hey, you can sing Jesus Loves Me. Amen. Well, it does something for you. You see, remind you of God's love for you. And so we just, we do that by singing. And so I just love to hear you sing. I, I, there was a time when I couldn't hear you sing. And I didn't like that much. It's a, you know, you, you, you come in here, sing these songs, and when, for a long time we sang to n nobody in this building, and it, it just, uh, even though the song is good, but boy, it's so much better when it's coming back this way. Yeah. Amen. So much better. Well, it's been a joy, hasn't had Brian McBride with us. Amen. Yeah, and uh, of course he's with us all the way through Thursday night, and uh, already been blessed uh, with what he preached this morning, if you were here yesterday. What a great message we had. He's going to sing a song for us tonight, and then he's going to preach. So let's give Brian McBride another Maranatha Baptist Church welcome to him. I don't do this much, just me singing. The girls do the singing. They let me come along because I own the band. And uh, but we'll give this one a try. faith would fail Christ will hold me fast when the tempter would prevail Christ will hold me fast I could never keep my hold on life's fearful path for my love is all he must hold me fast He will hold me fast He will hold me fast For my Savior loves me so He will hold me fast Those He saves are His delight Christ will hold me fast, precious in his holy sight. He will hold me fast. He'll not let my soul be lost. His promises shall last, bought by him at such a cost. He will hold
For my life he bled and died Christ will hold me fast Justice has been satisfied Raised with him to endless life, he will hold me fast till my faith is turned aside. When he comes at last, he will hold me fast. He will hold me fast for my sake. For my Savior loves me so, he will hold me fast. All right. One of my preachers said, are you coming by yourself? And I said, yes, sir. He said, will you sing? And I said, well, I hate to make the crowd endure that, but if you insist, I'll go ahead. I want us to go tonight to the book of Psalms, and I want to spend a few moments in the Songs of Degrees. We're going to be in the 120th Psalm for just a few moments tonight. I want to thank you for coming to the evening service. The sound man is waving at me. And, uh, hi, brother. Okay. It's because I don't have the mic on. Amen. Got her on now. You want to be careful about the sound man because if you get him mad, he'll turn you off in the middle of the preaching. <laughs> so I'm always polite to the sound man. Uh, I do want to thank you for being here, and I want to thank you for the good meal we had today, and thank you for the nice place I have to stay. I'm enjoying the prophet's house or whatever you call it down there. I'm enjoying it, and I appreciate it very much. And then I'm thankful that you chose to be in the church service tonight. I talked to my wife today and uh, talked to her every day two or three times, or uh, if I'm getting real lonesome, five or six times. But anyway, uh, you keep praying for Papa Pitt, and I will appreciate that very much. The 120th Psalm, in our book of Psalms, Starting in Psalm 120 and going through Psalm 134, we have 15 psalms that are titled Songs of Degrees. The word degree means an elevation or an ascension or a journey to a higher place. There's some discussion about how these psalms came to be here. Uh, we know who the divine author is. We don't always know who the human penman is. Some believe that Hezekiah put these together. I'll not go through all of the different theories about how they came to be, but these psalms in this group have a particular interest to me, and they are helpful and relevant, as is all the Bible, to the days that we're living. I, had a, I read a fellow said, if you're a Christian, you need to get your nose out of a 2,000-year-old book and start living in the present. But I'm going to tell you something. I find my Bible to be relevant to every age of life. Someone said one time, your Bible is as relevant as your morning newspaper, and really, that's not true. It's more relevant because your newspaper will tell you what happened yesterday. Your Bible will tell you what's going to happen tomorrow. If you want to find out what's going on and what to do about it, get in your Bible. And I especially enjoy the book of Psalms. J. Sidlow Baxter said that it would be hard to find a human experience that is not recorded somewhere in the book of Psalms. In fact, he titled this book, The Book of Experience. And we're going to look at one man's experience here in Psalm 120. Let's read it. I'll read it to you and you follow along if you will. A song of degrees. And then it said this, In my distress I cried unto the Lord, and he heard me. Deliver my soul, O Lord, from lying lips and from a deceitful tongue. What shall be given unto thee? Or what shall be done unto thee, thou false tongue? Sharp arrows of the mighty with coals of juniper. Woe is me that I sojourn in Meshech, that I dwell in the tents of Kedar. 
My soul hath long dwelt with him that hateth peace. I am for peace, but when I speak, they are for war. Let's pray a moment, and then I'm gonna preach to you a sermon called Distress in the First Degree. Now, Father, we need your help tonight. I pray that you'd speak to our hearts. I pray, Lord, that you'd get glory unto yourself. I want to thank you for how good you've been to us today. You've, ex- you've blessed us exceeding abundantly above all we could ask or think. You have been so good to us. We thank you. Thank you for being our God. Thank you that you would condescend to call us your children. Thank you for that mercy that endureth forever. Thank you that your compassions fail not. And thank you for the word of God. And I pray you'll help us tonight. Help your people. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. In our text tonight, the psalmist is surrounded. He will tell us this in verse number five. Woe is me that I sojourn in Meshach, that I dwell in the tents of Kedar. Now, if you study your history, your Bible history and your Bible geography, Meshach was the son, uh, Meshach was the son of Jephthah, the father of the Gentile nations. Kedar was a son of Ishmael, the father of the Arab nations. And on a map of Israel, the people of Meshach dwelt to the north of Israel, and the people of Kedar dwelt to the south of Israel. Now, I don't know tonight if the psalmist is telling us that literally he is in the midst of these people. He may be saying to us that the people that he's dwelling with have the characteristics of the people of Meshach and the people of Kedar. But whichever it is, whether he's talking literally about Meshach and Kedar or if he's talking about people that have those characteristics, he's telling us that he is surrounded by people who are different than he is in this, in this respect. They, have, they do not have the same values that he has. They do not have the same moral code that he has. They do not worship the same God that he worships. Their ethics are different. Their religion are different. And they're all around him and he's having to dwell in the midst of them and it is bothering him. It's put him in a state of distress. Now we could look at this passage and we could look at it prophetically and we would see a picture of the day when the lying Antichrist will bring the Gentile nations against Israel. But I'm more interested tonight in a practical application because what the psalmist is going to speak to us about is living as a Christian in an unchristian world. And that's where we're at, isn't it? We live in a society that cares nothing about Jesus, but we're supposed to live right in the midst of that. And so the psalmist will talk to us about that in this passage. There are three things I want you to note in it. Number one, I want you to notice why the psalmist is distressed. What is so distressing to him that he would begin the psalm like this? In my distress. What is distressing? Well, first of all, he is distressed because he's surrounded by a crafty people. He's surrounded by liars. Notice what he says in verse 2. He talks about lying lips in verse 2 and a deceitful tongue. In verse 3, he talks about a false tongue. So we have lying lips, a deceitful tongue, and a false tongue. Now, if you study those words, each one of those words has to do with treachery. He's not talking about somebody who's telling a lie just to impress you or is exaggerating the truth. He's talking about people who are lying to you because they want to get something out of you. They're trying to pull something over on you. They are treacherous in what they say. And I would say to you, that's the day we're living in. We're surrounded by people who are telling lies because they want power. They're telling lies because they want to make merchandise of the people of God. And and we're warned about that in the New Testament. And so he's surrounded by treachery and liars and craftiness. Now, it interests me where this book is or where this chapter is in our Bible. Because it's a chapter about lying. But what was the previous chapter? Psalm 119. What's it about? It's about truth. 
It's all about the word of God, the only truth that we have. And in Psalm 119, we're told that his word is the law and the ways of God and the testimonies of God and the statutes of God and the commandments of God and the judgments of God. And if we'll follow the law and be and follow the truth, we'll be blessed, we'll be upright, we'll be cleansed, we'll rejoice, we'll have liberty, we'll have understanding. And then the psalmist will say this, in Psalm 119 and 163, he'll say, I hate and abhor lying, but thy law do I love. And then in Psalm 120, this psalmist says, I'm surrounded by lies, lying everywhere. David knew what it was like. I don't know if David had anything to do with this psalm, but David knew what it was like to be lied about. He said to Saul in 1 Samuel 24, 9, Wherefore hearest thou men's words, saying, Behold, David seeketh thy hurt. He said, Saul, they're lying to you. I'm not trying to hurt you. It's getting today, it's hard to tell the truth from a lie sometimes. Folks seem sincere in what they say, and yet they'll lie while they're looking you right in the eye. It's a treacherous time. So the psalmist is distressed because he's surrounded by crafty people. He's also distressed because he's surrounded by a contentious people. Now watch what he said in verse 6. My soul hath long dwelt with him that hateth peace. Now think about that. They hate peace. Peace. They don't want peace. He'll say in verse 7, I am for peace, but when I speak, they are for war. The psalmist said, it doesn't matter what I say to them. It doesn't matter what I offer them. It doesn't matter what I do. They want to fuss. They want to fight. They want to have war. They hate peace. We see that in our world today and in our society. There's some folks, they're not going to be peaceful no matter what you say to them. They don't want peace no matter what you do for them. They want war. They want destruction. And the psalmist is surrounded by this crowd. You know what they are? They are implacable and unreasonable. Do you remember when Paul would ask us to pray in the New Testament? And he said, pray. One, he gave us several prayer requests. But one of them was pray that we would be delivered from wicked and unreasonable men. Did you know those two things always go together? Wickedness and unreasonable. You know what wickedness it'll do? It'll cause you to lose the ability to reason and tell right from wrong. It's called in the New Testament reprobation or reprobate. And we see that. You say, well, preacher, I, I live a wicked life. It'll be fine. I'll get away. No, here's what'll happen. Your ability to reason and tell the truth and discern the truth will leave you the further you get into that wickedness. So we have a crafty people and a contentious people. And then there's a third thing, though the psalmist does not mention it specifically, it is implied when he mentions Meshach and Kedar. The third thing that would be bothering him is the crafty people and the contentious people seem to be conquering people. It looks like they're winning. It looks like the crowd that loves lies is coming out on top. We'll have to compare some scripture and I won't ask you to turn there. You can turn if you want, but I'm just going to read them off of my notes. In Ezekiel 32, the Bible talks about Meshach and it said they caused their terror in the land of the living. And then in Isaiah 21, in verse 17, the Bible speaks of the mighty men of the children of Kedar. So here are these folks from Meshach and Kedar. They're lying. They're involved in warfare. They don't want any peace. And they seem to be conquering everybody they come in contact with. Does it bother you, dear Christian friend, when you look around and it looks like the wicked are winning? It looks like they're coming out on top? It looks like the liars are getting away with their lies. It looks like those that hate peace are going to keep on getting stronger and stronger. And it's bothersome. And so the psalmist is like you and like me. He's distressed by the situation. But in the middle of this, the psalmist will tell us something else. He'll tell us not only why he is distressed, he'll tell us what he has decided. The psalmist has made some decisions in the middle of this distress. You and I need to make some decisions in this society that we live in. I want you to notice three things we'll find in our text. I want you to notice he has decided, first of all, he will not allow himself to be comfortable with the lies that surround him. Notice what he says in verse number five. Woe is me. 
Now you read your Bible, that woe, that's a burden. Whenever you read about a woe, that is a burden on someone's life if it's not a burden that's sent from God. He said, woe is me that I sojourn in Meshach, that I dwell in the tents of Kedar. And then he makes this statement, which is a common statement or, or, or common idea throughout the book of Psalms. He said, my soul hath long dwelt with him that hateth peace. The psalmist said, I'm telling you, the days are getting longer and longer. I've had all I can stand of this. He is not comfortable in the middle of this lying. He is not comfortable in the middle of this warfare. He will not settle down in it. He'll not just say, well, you know, I can't do anything about it, so I'm just going to have to learn to live with it. He said, no, I refuse. I refuse to be comfortable in this situation. I'll tell you what happens to us in our Christian life. We face difficulty and lying and face those that want warfare when we want peace. And pretty soon we say, well, there isn't anything I can do about it. I'm just going to hunker down and I'm just going to try and have to learn to live with it. The psalmist said, nope, it's been going on too long. I'm not at home with it. I'm not comfortable with it. I refuse to become comfortable with lies. I hope that's the decision you've made tonight. Not only he will not allow himself to be comfortable, I notice what he says in verse 7. Look at it again. He said, I am for peace, but when I speak, they are for war. Now, think about what he just said. He said, I am for peace. He told us in the previous verse that those that are around him, they hate peace, and he tells us at the end of verse 7 that they are for war, but in between that, he makes an emphatic statement. He said, I am for peace. You know what he's saying? He said, I'm not only, I've not only decided I'll not allow myself to be comfortable, I also will not allow myself to be compromised. I read something in the news, I think it was yesterday, where a fellow was writing an editorial and he said, well, he said, they hate us, it's time for us to hate them back. Well, that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says, render unto no man, Evil for evil. As a matter of fact, three times in the New Testament. In Romans 12, 17, recompense to no man evil for evil. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 15, see that none render evil for evil unto any man. In 1 Peter 3, 9, not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing, but contrarywise blessing, knowing that ye are thereunto called, that ye should inherit a blessing. Now here the psalmist is saying they're for war and they hate peace but I am for peace and I will not let them hate their hatred of peace cause me to hate peace. I will not sink to the level that my enemies are living. Somebody said well you know preacher they wronged me. Here's what we like to say. We like to say well they wronged me. I have a right to get back. We like to throw that word right in there. Makes us feel a little bit better about it. But God did not say, render unto no man right for evil. He said, render unto no man evil for evil. Now think about what he said. If our dear brother here does evil to me, then evil's coming this way. So if I say, all right, I'm going to get him back, you know what God said? That same evil that came this way is now going that way. He called the hurt and the getting back for the hurt, he called them both the same thing. Render unto no man evil for evil. You say, well, preacher, what I did was better because they did it first. No, God didn't say that. God said what you did was just as wicked as what they did. Your attempt to get even, your attempt to make them hurt because they hurt you was just as evil as the wickedness they did to you. That's the way God looked at it. So he said we're to overcome evil with good. I want to remind you of something. We preach about the world, we preach about worldly thinking and the attitudes of the world, but I want to remind you something. For God so loved the world. You remember that? For God so, I'm not talking about the world's philosophy, but the world themselves, the people, God loved them. And when they were bad to God, He was good to them. In fact, and I'll talk about this a little later, when you were for war with God, he was for peace with you. And when you hated him, he loved you. And so the psalmist said, I'll not sink down there. I'll not be compromised. And then he says something else. 
He said, I've decided not, I will not allow myself to be comfortable. I will not allow myself to be compromised. And then I like this, and I'm going to use this word because I hear it all, I hear it all the time now. I, I hear it, people saying this about this culture. He said, I, I will not allow myself to be canceled. Now watch what he said in verse 7 again. Look at it. I am for peace. Now look at this little phrase. But when I speak. Man, I like that right there. He didn't say if I speak. He said when I speak. You know what he's saying? He's saying they're against the truth. They're against peace. They are for war. They'd like me to shut up. They'd like me to be quiet, but I'm not going to. I'm not going to be silenced. I'm not going to have the opinion of God canceled. I'm not going to have the word of God silenced. I'm going to tell the truth whether anybody's willing to listen or not. I'm going to take a stand for what is right. I'm going to tell the truth about the thing. Let's just tell the truth. Let's just speak. That's what they did in the book of Acts. Daily in the temple in every house they ceased not to teach and to preach Jesus Christ. I remember them going down to the river where Lydia was and what did they do? They taught the Bible and that woman listened. There were others no doubt that did not listen. I remember Paul preaching at Mars Hill and the Bible said some mocked. Remember? They said when he spoke of the resurrection of the dead it said some mocked. Others said we will hear thee again on this matter. But then it said how be it some believed. I'm going to tell you, friend, you said, preacher, I'm just going to shut up because nobody's listening. You don't know who's listening. As somebody standing off the side somewhere might hear the word of God and the seed of faith I'll be put down in their soul and they might get born again. Let's not let them make us quiet. Let's not be silenced. Let's tell wherever we can. Speak whenever we get an opportunity. He said, when I speak. I take it he was planning on it. He was looking for an opportunity. He was going to say something to somebody somewhere about the goodness of God. So we have the psalmist's distress. We have what the psalmist has decided. And then let me say this and I'll be done. I want you to see where the psalmist finds deliverance in the middle of his distress. Because he's going to tell us in this passage what has helped him and what will help him in this distress. The first thing is, he starts out the verse, the, the, the chapter this way. The first thing that he's going to do to find help is he's going to cry unto the Lord. Look what he said. In my distress, I cried unto the Lord. A fellow told me one time, he said, Brother Brian, let me give you a definition of complaining. I said, okay. He said, complaining is when you tell the problem to somebody who can't do anything about it. He said, that's complaining. So I take that to mean it's not complaining if I take it to someone who can do something about it. And I happen to know someone who can do something about every situation I get in in life, and that somebody is the Lord. The Bible said, come therefore boldly to the throne of grace to obtain mercy and to find grace to help in time of need. I remember God said in the Old Testament, I always called this God's phone number. Jeremiah 33, 3, where he said, call unto me and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. I tell you, friend, you and I need to pray. This is a day to pray. This is a time to pray to get in our prayer closet and get a hold of the altar and get a hold of God and pray and move heaven. I noticed I, I, some of you were not here, probably most of you were not here, but yesterday your dear pastor preached a wonderful message in the camp meeting uh, rally and he was preaching there out of the book of Mark chapter number five and I noticed while he was preaching that the Bible said those demons, you remember? Those demons, their name was Legion, you remember? And Jesus said, what is thy name? And he said, Legion, for we are many. And I noticed that those demons were all in the same place and then the Bible said that all of them they all besought him that they would that he would send them into the swine and the Bible said he gave them leave now did you ever think about that here are all these demons and they're in one accord and they asked Jesus for something and they got it I looked at that and I thought to myself wonder what we could get accomplished if all of us would get in one accord if all of us would get in one place and all of us would bombard the throne room of heaven 
heaven. Man, if he would answer theirs, surely he'll answer the cry of his children. We ought to pray. We ought to pray. How's your prayer life? The psalmist said, here's what I'm gonna do. They won't listen to me, but I'm gonna cry unto the Lord. And that's the second thing he will tell us. He not only said in my distress, I cried unto the Lord, but then he gives us this word of confidence. He said, and he heard me. I cried and got hurt. Did you ever feel like somebody wasn't listening to you? I was preaching a few weeks ago up in Indiana and I, I got to preaching and I looked, looked up at the back and there was a young lady in the back of the church. It wasn't that far. It was only about half the distance of this auditorium. And I looked up and she's texting on her phone. And I, I started to get after her. I did, I started to. And then I stopped, and I don't know if this is right thinking or not, but I thought, well, if you don't have enough power to get her attention, you probably don't deserve it anyway, so leave her alone. So I didn't get after her. But she wasn't listening. And sometimes people don't listen. But the psalmist said, when I cried to the Lord, he heard me. <laughs> About an hour from here, I have two grandsons. Have I mentioned my grandsons this week? <laughs> Jedediah and Joshua. Joshua's nine months and Jedediah's five years old. And Jedediah can talk up a storm. And he can talk fast. And I'm getting a little hard of hearing. And uh, so sometimes he'll say something and I don't catch it. So here's what I'll do. I'll say, now say that again. Tell Pap all that again. And I'll lean over. You know what I'm doing? I'm inclining my ear unto him. Because I'm interested in what he has to say. I want to know what he said. The psalmist will tell us in another place. He said, I cried unto the Lord and God inclined his ear. Now think about this. Think about you getting in your prayer closet. And you cry out to God like a little child. And God in heaven says, I want, to, I want to make sure I get all this. I want to hear what you have to say. I'm interested. We have confidence that he will hear our prayers. Now, sometimes it doesn't seem like he hears our prayers. And the reason it doesn't seem that way is because we don't get an answer right when we thought we should. Do you remember the Syrophoenician woman in Matthew 15 who came to Jesus and she said, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me, for my daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. Do you remember what the next verse says? And he answered her, not a word. Boy, that don't sound good. But let me remind you what he did not say. He didn't say, the Bible did not say, he heard not a word. And sometimes the Lord doesn't answer when we think he ought to, but it doesn't mean he didn't hear. And we know that he heard because later on he will grant her request. When he gets her to the place that he wants her to be, he will grant the request. Some say, well, preacher, I prayed and God didn't hear me. How do you know he didn't hear you? His ear is inclined. The Bible said, that he's touched with the feelings of our infirmities, our high priest. He hears. He hears. I was reading that verse one day. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, and yet without sin. And I was reading that verse, and I thought about that word touched, and so I began to study it out and see what I could figure out about being touched with the feelings. It's, it's pretty obvious, but... One writer said this. He said the best way to explain that word touched is he said if you had two harps and you put them in a room and they are in perfect tune, absolute perfect tune with each other. He said when you pluck the string on this harp, the string on this harp will vibrate in response. And he said that's what that word touched means. I take that to mean that when my heart strings are plucked, God is in such perfect tune with me that his heart strings are plucked in response to mine. He's touched 
with the feelings of our infirmities. So the psalmist said, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to cry unto the Lord and I'm going to reckon that he hears me. He heard me. There's a third thing I think that will help him and it'll help us in this. And that is not only he has confidence and he'll cry, but he's going to consider something. Now, watch our text again. He says in verse number three, what shall be given unto thee or what shall be done unto thee, thou false tongue? And then he tells us in verse four, sharp arrows of the mighty with coals of juniper. Now, if you read the Old Testament and read the Psalms, in the Psalm 64, the Bible said this, they encourage themselves in an evil matter. They commune of laying snares privily, say, say, who shall see them? They search out iniquities. They accomplish a diligent search, but the inward thought of every one of them in the heart is deep. But God shall shoot at them with an arrow. Suddenly shall they be wounded. Now the psalmist said, when I hear all this lying, all this treachery, I say to myself, what's the end of this going to be? And he said, here's the end. Them that are shooting out them arrows of lies are going to get shot at by God. And then he talks about these coals of juniper. Now I don't have time to preach on the, all these coals of juniper. Let me just say this to you. The coals of juniper were known for the, for the great heat they would throw off and for how long an extended period of time they would throw off heat. So what the psalmist is referencing here and implying here is those is what we're told in the New Testament when the Bible said, all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire. Now you know what the psalmist is doing? Here's what he's doing. He's fixing the problem that he had back in point number one. He looked and he said it looked like the, it looked like the wicked were winning. It looked like they were gonna get by. But he said, you know what? When I look at the end of the thing, when I think about where this is going, I am reminded the wicked are not going to win. They are not going to overcome God. As a matter of fact, the Bible in those verses I read to you earlier about the terror in the land of the living that, that Meshach caused, it says they'll all be slain by the sword. And when I mentioned the mighty men of the children of Kedar, Isaiah went on to say they shall be diminished. The psalmist is saying they look like they're getting away. They look like they're winning. But we know who's going going to win in the end. We know that truth will out in the end. We know which side comes out on top. God will win. So he said, I'm going to consider the end of it. Now let me say one other thing about Kedar. Maybe two things. The psalmist mentioned Kedar. I want to read you some verses. You can turn there if you want to, but you don't have to. You can write them down, look at them later. Isaiah 42 10. Now listen to these verses, would you please? Sing unto the Lord a new song and his praise from the end of the earth. Ye that go down to the sea and all that is therein, the isles and the inhabitants thereof, let the wilderness and the cities thereof lift up their voice. The villages that Kedar doth inhabit, let the inhabitants of the rocks sing. Let them shout from the top of the mountains. Let them give glory unto the Lord and declare his praise in the island. Did you hear who's going to be involved in that? Them that are dwelling in Kedar. I take that to mean that the psalmist is going to speak up. And even though the majority of the people of Kedar are going to be for war and they don't want to fight and they don't want to hear it, apparently somebody in Kedar was listening. You say, well, preacher, nobody's listening. Nobody wants the truth. Nobody wants to know what's right. Oh, wait a minute, friends. Somewhere there's somebody who's listening. and You may not know it when you speak. There were two boys, two college boys, who wanted to practice their preaching. And nobody let them preach anywhere. And so there was a prayer, a little prayer chapel on the side of the road near where they were going to college. So those two college boys went down and they would take turns preaching to each other. One would stand in the pulpit, and one would sit in the pew. And the one in the pulpit would preach to the one in the pew. And when he got done, they'd switch places. And then the one that had been in the pew is now in the pulpit. He's preaching to the one that's in the pew. I don't know if either one of them ever had revival, but they preached to each other. 
Some years ago, one of those young men was pastoring a church. And they had a service one night, had some visitors. And the pastor got up and he said, you know, he said, I, I want to have a little testimony time. And I'd like for folks to testify a little bit. First this one did, then that one, then the other one. And then a man stood up and he said, I want to tell you how I got saved. He said, I had a, a little place I would walk. And he said, along my walk where I walked, there was a prayer chapel. He said, one day I was walking and as I came to that prayer chapel, I heard loud voices. And he said, I looked in the window and there was a young man up preaching and a young man sitting in the pew. And he said, I stood outside the door and listened and I got under conviction and I got born again. You see, you don't know who's listening. God has a way of bringing people by. Somebody that needs to hear the gospel. So don't get quiet just because the world doesn't seem like they care. Tell somebody. Now there's one last thing I'll say. Would you look at verse 7 again? I am for peace, but when I speak, they are for war. Now, I've been preaching about, about God's people being for peace and the world being for war. But we could very easily, very easily look at this passage and apply it to the Lord Jesus, who for 23 years of my life was for peace with me, and I was for war. And every time he spoke to me, I was for war. And every time I heard about him, I was for war. But one day, one day, he just kept on speaking. Amen. And kept on speaking. Yeah. And kept on speaking. And one day, I laid down my weapons of war. Amen. And I threw up the white flag. Yeah. And I said, I'm done fighting. Amen. Lord, I'm fighting a battle I can't win. And the truth of the matter is I'm fighting a battle I really don't even want to fight in the first place. And I just laid down my weapons and said, Lord, I yield, I surrender, I, throw up the, I run up the white flag. No more fighting with you, Lord. No more of that. And I surrendered and God saved my soul. You remember when that happened in your life? You remember how you was against it? You remember how you fussed? Remember how you might have fussed and said, well, I'm not a sinner. I don't need to be, remember fussing? You remember fighting? I'm pretty good. I'm all right. You remember that? But then one day you saw the truth, didn't you? And you laid down your weapons of war. I wonder if there'd be somebody here tonight. You're still fighting. You're still at war with God. You say, oh, preacher, I'm not at war with God. If you've never been saved, you are at war with God. The Bible calls you the enemy of God, an adversary of God. You say, well, I don't have anything against God. You have something against him. If you will not receive the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, you are at war with God. But here's what I'm going to tell you. He's for peace with you. Amen. He wants you to have peace. He wants you to have peace with God and the peace of God. He wants you to have peace. All you're going to have to do is just surrender. Preacher, what do I do? Just lay down your arms. Lay down your weapons. Throw up the white flag. Said, I'm finished, Lord. No more fighting. Everything's yours. You can have your way. And if you do that, God will hear you and he'll give you peace. I want you to bow your heads a moment. Your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed. Let me ask you this question first of all. Are you at peace with God? Do you have peace? Are you at peace with him or are you still at war? You still fussing with him and arguing with him and fighting with him and talking back to him or do you have peace with God? You could have peace with him before you leave. Just let him have his way. Would there be somebody tonight, our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed and our brother's coming to the piano. Would there be somebody tonight say, Preacher, I'm not at peace with God, but I want to be. I want to be at peace with God. Would you pray for me? If you lift your hand up, that's what I'll do. I'll pray for you. I won't come to you or call your name or point you out. Say, preacher, I want to be at peace with God, but I'm not. Would you pray? I'm tired of the battle. I'm tired of fighting with him. I'm tired of the war. 
Would you pray for me? Is there anybody like that tonight? And I'll ask you this, and we'll spend some time at the altar. Are you distressed like the psalmist? You look around and preacher, these are distressing times. I'm distressed in my heart. Would you come call on him tonight? Would you tell him what's going on in your heart? Why don't you ask him for courage to speak and to take a stand? Now, Father, you help us tonight. Work in the hearts of your people. Have your will and way. And get glory unto yourself. Thank you for fighting our battles promising us victory. Help us to trust you tonight. Thank you for being willing to be at peace with us. Help us now in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let's stand to our feet a moment. You're standing and our brother's playing and our heads are bowed and he's playing all to Jesus. I surrender all to him I freely give. Here's an altar. You need to come. You come tonight while we wait. God dealt with your heart. The altar is open. You come. While he plays, I want us just to take a moment and pray. Pray for this meeting this week. Pray that God's people will be revived. Have a closer walk with him. That the world may see Christ in us. So let's just take a moment and ask God's help to help us. Thank you, Lord, for meeting with us this evening. We thank you, God, for your sweet spirit. And, Lord, we ask you, Father, for us to put our focus, Father, upon you tonight. And, Lord, this week and every day, may we just focus upon God. Pay attention to what God would have us to do. Pray for people. Pray for the peace of God, not only in our life, but in the lives of others. May they see Christ in us. Lord, bless. While we need your help and your guidance, and Lord, save our lost people. Give us the right words and the testimony that we need for the gospel to go forth. Thank you, Lord, for your help. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for saving us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, what a great service. What a great message. Amen. How we need that so much to sow in our lives. Now, tomorrow night, we're continuing on in revival. How many is going to pray? Let's pray tonight before we go to bed. Let's pray in the morning. Pray throughout the day. Uh, and for the meeting tomorrow evening, 7 o'clock, you come back and, and join with us and uh, bring somebody with you, invite somebody to come. Uh, tell them, say, you meet me at church tonight. You never know, they just might.
Amen. There's people looking for things now. People looking for answers. You see, and we have the answer. Amen. So uh, come back with us at 7 o'clock. I want to remind everyone that usually attends the Wednesday morning Bible study. We will not be having Wednesday morning Bible study this week. So keep that in mind and pass the word around uh, because the revival. We're going to be focused on it uh, for a while. And we're going to be praying uh, for God to meet with us in a mighty way. And, and um, I'm going to do as I've done in the past when it comes to revival meetings. I'm not going to dismiss in prayer tonight. I want us to continue in prayer. Amen. Remain in a spirit of prayer and, and, and a spirit of expectation. Expect God to do something. Amen. So you be praying, and I'll be looking for you tomorrow night at 7 o'clock. God bless you, and thank you for being here. Be careful. Okay, no, no school of the Bible this week if you're in the school of the Bible. None this week. Whosoever